Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. My name is Danielle Roberge. I'm cultural programming officer. The museum is very proud to present in a Canadian exclusive the finest Fabergé collection outside of Russia from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts in Richmond. The exhibition comprises some 240 objects, including four of the 43 remaining famous Easter eggs commissioned by the Romanovs. The museum is also honored to launch these three days of special events for VIPs with the lecture of Mr. Barry Schiffman. Mr. Schiffman is Sydney and Francis Lewis Family Curator of Decorative Arts, 1890 to the present, at the VMFA. He joined the staff of the museum in 07. His primary responsibilities include man managing the internationally known collections of American and European Art Nouveau and Art Deco. In addition, Schiffman is in charge of the Fabergé and Russian decorative arts. In 1947, Lillian Thomas Pratt bequeathed a remarkable collection of more than 400 Russian objects, including five imperial Easter eggs and approximately 170 additional works from the House of Fabergé. Mr. Schiffman is currently overseeing the forthcoming reinstallation of the Fabergé collection at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our guest, Mr. Barry Schiffman. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here, and thank you for hosting the Fabergé collection. It's absolutely splendid. It's so beautiful. It's always thrilling for curators to see a collection that they curate in a specific gallery in other museums. And I can say the curators here and the entire staff made a magnificent exhibition. Many congratulations. <laughs> And uh, today, I hope I'm going to give a very broad overview, which on the surface looks simple, but Fabergé, I find, an extraordinarily complicated subject. So I thought the first hour, half hour, I would just talk about the man and what he does and the workshops and all of that. It is complicated, but I always say he's a jeweler, and his firm is a jewelry firm and a silversmith firm. And then the second half, we'll talk about specific objects in the Pratt collection. I have to say at the outset, I am not a native Russian speaker. And um, the, the pieces that I picked are my own personal favorites, but I hope some of the stars in the collection. But I urge you to go on upstairs later or during the week to see the exhibition. And they've done a beautiful job, the staff, of uh, installing the collection. I'm going to highlight some of the masterpieces from the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts. Uh, they were bequeathed to the museum by Lillian Thomas Pratt. We'll talk about her briefly at the end. It's the largest museum collection of Fabergé in the world, public collection, museum collection. Certainly, the largest private collection is 700 objects owned by Her Majesty the Queen of England. <laughs> Besides various jeweled objects by Fabergé now in Richmond, we're going to closely examine the five celebrated imperial Easter eggs at the museum. That's Mr. Fabergé. We'll see him more. And those are the five celebrated Easter eggs, four of which are here. This is the largest group of imperial eggs by Fabergé outside of Russia. I'm very pleased that four of the five are the Museum of Montreal. In today's presentation, I will briefly comment about Carl Fabergé, for the literature on this famous jeweler is vast. I will also mention some of the workshops and workmasters who were in charge of these major workshops. At Fabergé's impressive establishment, his staff was over 500 people. 
300 workers in St. Petersburg and 200 workers in Moscow. So it's not one individual man making over 200,000 objects. It's over 500 work people uh, in what we call the House of Fabergé, the firm of Fabergé. I believe it's relevant to mention some of the hallmarks found on authentic objects by Fabergé. Considering there are so many forgeries now on the market and available to unsuspecting collectors. Looks good. No, it's one of our forgeries. Uh, because there is such a desire for Fabergé objects, buyers must be aware of the deception that exists. Real deception, forgeries, meant to deceive. Although I only am able to briefly touch on the subject, any serious collector ought to spend time researching this aspect as there are costly pit pitfalls. Any talk about Fabergé must also take into account of the patronage of the Russian imperial family, especially Tsar Alexander III and his son, later Nicholas II, last of the Romanov Tsars. Tsar Alexander III is associated with the first of the 50 imperial eggs created from 1885, which he gave as a gift to his wife, Empress Maria Fedorovna. Certainly, the ill-fated Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, Alexandra, feature in our story. The tragedy which overtook Russia in the early 20th century and the subsequent murder of the imperial family in 1918 is related to the story of Fabergé and the diverse group of objects created by the firm. The Tsar abdicated in March 1917 the October Revolution took place, and the Bolshevik Soviet Republic was proclaimed. The second half of my presentation will focus on some objects, now at the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, from the collection of Lillian Thomas Pratt. She donated over 500 objects, of which almost 170 are by or attributed to Fabergé. Mrs. Pratt, along with several other major collectors in the United States, such as Marjorie Merriweather Post, bought many important Fabergé objects from Arm & Hammer and another gallery, A la Vie Russie, as well as other dealers in the 1930s and 40s. Unfortunately, from the 1920s onward, many Fabergé objects were destroyed by the Soviet officials for their gemstones. Gustav Fabergé, the father of the more famous Karl, was born in 1814 in Pernu, in present-day Estonia, which was at the time part of the Russian Empire. By 1841, he had obtained the title of Master Goldsmith. The following year, Gustav opened a jewelry shop in St. Petersburg. Here's a scene of one of the famous streets at the time. His son, Karl, of French Huguenot descent, was born in May 1846 in the Russian capital. In 1860, Gustav Fabergé and his family, including Karl, moved to Dresden, Germany, although he left his shop in the hands of his partner in St. Petersburg. At the time, Gustav's son Karl was confirmed in the Dresden church, and he began a four-year apprenticeship in Europe, seeing the great collections of jewelry and gold and silver. He trained as a goldsmith there. By 1865, Karl returned to St. Petersburg and enters his father's firm. Here he is again working. One year later, he received his certificate as temporary merchant of the Second Guild. At this period, he began to sell jewelry to the imperial cabinet, or the imperial household. And most important, he also offered his services free of charge, appraising and restoring jewelry and objects of art in the treasury of the Hermitage Museum. There, he was able to closely examine a whole myriad of great jeweled treasuries from antiquity, uh, which influenced his later work. And he did this work free of charge. In 1872, 
Carl Fabergé took over his father's jewelry business. Ten years later, 1882, the firm participated in the important Pan American Industrial Exhibition in Moscow. They were awarded a prize at that firm, uh, at that exhibition. By 1885, he was named supplier to him, the imperial court when the first of the imperial eggs were created for Tsar Alexander III. In addition to his business in St. Petersburg, Carl Fabergé, who was an innovative and successful businessman, founded a Moscow branch. I think they're highlighted here. It may be difficult to see. Uh, this is important because he really worked and had firms all over. The Moscow branch founded in 1887. He established a branch in Odessa, 1901, one in Kiev, and very important to our story, a gallery was founded in London in 1904. The London establishment was successful due to the patronage of the royal family, particularly Queen Alexandra, who was the sister of Empress Maria Fredorovna, who was the wife of Tsar Alexander III. Queen Alexandra was the sister of the Empress, and her husband, of course, was Edward VII. And she and the British royal family bought from the London firm and, importantly, were given many gifts. While we're looking at this map of the Russian, Russian Empire, I'd like to point out the fact that the hard stones that Fabergé valued so much were acquired wholesale from the Imperial Peterhof Lapidary Works in Peterhof, the A. Katrinburg Works, and elsewhere. They're sort of listed here. The material itself, the hard stones, were found in the Urals and Siberia. According to the memoirs of Francois Bourbon, the chief designer at Fabergé, all the lapidary work was carried out at the Werfels Works in St. Petersburg and the Stern Works in Uberstein, Germany, according to designs and models produced by the Fabergé firm. After 1908, Fabergé had his own lapidary workshops and can work the stones there. And you'll see throughout the exhibition uh, hard stones, which are among the most prized objects of the Fabergé firm. With his growing success, Carl Fabergé bought large premises at 24 Bolshoi Street in 1898. And the firm reopened here in 1900, the main street uh, for fine works of art shops. This impressive building included sales rooms, design studios, workmaster studios, and even living quarters for Fabergé and his family, as well as for his key workmasters. And these workmasters are very important. Here is the design studio at Fabergé's workshop. The designing, not the implementing. By 1900, Fabergé was among the most successful and internationally known Russian jewelers and silversmiths. At this time, the firm participated in the important Paris Universal Exhibition, where they displayed some imperial Easter eggs and imperial regalia. Fabergé was a member of the jury and, due to his great success, was awarded a gold medal and the Cross of the Legion of Honor. Among the treasures displayed in Paris were these magnificent miniature imperial regalia, replicas of the Russian crown jewels based on 18th century examples. So these are smaller replicas of the 18th century regalia. The firm continued to create beautiful and rare jewelry, sadly, much of which is lost. Here are some of the design drawings uh, for jewelry, and it's the jewelry that's really lost today. Fabergé himself was more the brains of the establishment, while it was the brilliant and talented workshop masters who created the exquisite objects stamped by Fabergé. Here are the three workshop masters, and they had 60 or so individuals. The pieces are stamped by these individuals. We'll be talking about Perkin at the top and Wigstrom. Uh, these are uh, the people who directed the craftspeople. It is these head workmasters whose initials in Cyrillic 
are stamped on objects marked by Fabergé. For instance, the workshop of August Holmström was likely responsible for jewelry designs. The more famous and well-known Perkin joined the firm in 1884 and was appointed head. Here's his workshop, along with an enamel cane by him, owned by the Virginia Museum at the top right, and a smaller view of the enameling workshops. So these precious archival photographs are very important to us. Perkin was responsible for at least half the Fabergé imperial eggs. At his death, Wigstrom was named headmaster in 1903. Piece we own in the museum on the far right, stamped by Wigstrom, and some recently discovered watercolors from the Wigstrom workshops, very precious documents. Under Wigstrom's guidance, the company's prevalent Rococo and Art Nouveau styles were replaced by the neoclassical style, such as the calendar here, in the latest Parisian taste. We'll talk a little about the Parisian taste or the European taste, such as this, and the neo-Russian or old Russian style. One of the most important aspects of Fabergé's objects that help us to authenticate objects are the hallmarks. Let us briefly examine some of these marks. My comments are not meant to be definitive or complete. I just want to introduce you to the complexities of the subject. You can see the Fabergé mark at the top. The K below that is the St. Petersburg. Below it, you see the Moscow marks. And at the very bottom, the London marks. But marks are the most forged, right? So there's six or seven or eight other criteria. More marks. The silver and gold content is at the top, 56, sort of 18 or 24 carat. The city mark in the center with the headdress of the woman. And then the marks of Moscow. Here's Fabergé's imperial rosebud Easter egg presented by Tsar Nicholas II and his wife, to his wife Alexandra in 1895. It is clearly marked, I hope you can see it at the center, the Cyrillic initials of Perkin, Fabergé in Cyrillic, and the assay mark of 56, showing the gold standard for 14 karat gold. So when they're marked, they're beautifully marked, and they help us a great deal. Members of the Russian aristocracy, foreign royalty, and rich Americans all patronized Fabergé's main showroom in St. Petersburg. Here's the main showroom. The firm is reputed to have created over 150,000 unique, one-of-a-kind objects. According to Fabergé himself, no two objects were alike. Moreover, if any object did not meet his exacting standard in terms of craftsmanship and excellence, they were destroyed. A major aspect of Fabergé's success is his exquisite quality of his jewelry, silver and gold. And you'll see it in the galleries. It's a word I rarely use, but they are breathtaking in their exquisite refinement and beauty. Many objects were provided with their own wood and silk lined boxes. These fitted boxes also help us to authenticate a work by Fabergé. Here's one with this original box and the marks at the top in the center, what location helps us to date it. There are also documents and archives that scholars use to determine if an object was made by Fabergé. Here's one of the original documents I think it's in French and English, uh, Russian. Therefore, to determine the authenticity of objects definitely by Fabergé, it is important to take into account several things. The quality and craftsmanship of the highest standard. Do the hallmarks confirm or dispute an attribution? Is there a scratch inventory number that can be traced to the Russian archives? 
Are there additional archived documents that exist for the object? And does the piece have its original fitted case? The House of Fabergé closed in 1918. Disguised as citizens from Leveland with German passports, Karl Fabergé and his family escaped Russia. He died in 1920. Before we briefly discuss the imperial family and some of the objects of the Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, I want to comment about this poignant image. It shows a display of Russian crown jewels and 12 imperial Easter eggs by Fabergé. The photograph was taken uh, at Gokram's headquarters in 1923. They were the official Soviet agency to sell goods for hard cash. Many fabulous jeweled treasure, treasury items, such as the imperial regalia, as well as the greatest of the Fabergé creations, were sold in the 1920s. I think I have a detail. Yes. I think there are 12 Easter eggs. I think one of them is our, uh, Virginia Museums. But one of the questions everyone asks is what happened to all the treasures? Well, many were sold. Among the major players in the history of Fabergé is, of course, the Russian imperial family. Fabergé is so closely associated with the last two czars of Russia, Alexander III and his son, Nicholas II. In, in 1881, after the murder of Tsar Alexander II, his son was crowned Alexander III. Here he is. He and his wife, Empress Maria Fedorovna, uh, daughter of the King of Denmark, uh, she's there, patronized Fabergé. And in 1866, she, the empress, took the name Maria Fedorovna, and a number of the pieces you'll see in the galleries were pot, bought by her, and we have the documents to prove it. These are the parents of Nicholas II. And it's Maria Fedorovna's sister, Alexandra, wife of the King of England, who bought and received gifts of Fabergé. The tradition of offering eggs as gift um, I think that's wrong. Yeah. During Easter is had a long and sustained history. Here are some of the smaller jeweled eggs. I think we have 88. Mrs. Pratt obviously liked little uh, eggs. This activity is important in Slavic culture and to Orthodox tradition. The egg harks back to a pagan tradition celebrating the beginning of the seasonal cycle in spring and the rebirth of nature which Christianity was quick to associate with the mystery of Christ's resurrection at Easter. Fabergé took advantage of this love of Easter to create both miniature eggs, such as these, as well as magnificent imperial Easter eggs. As is well known, there, are 50, there were 50 imperial eggs offered as gifts to Tsar Alexander I and his son to his wife as well. 43 are extant today, and seven are, quote, lost. Francis Beerborn wrote that the imperial eggs were fabricated, required one year in production, beginning just after Easter each year, and that they were usually presented on Good Friday. In the day preceding their presentation, initially by Mr. Fabergé himself, and later by his chief assistant or eldest son, Eugene, the craftsmen, quote, remained at their place of work until Fabergé returned from Zatskyo Selo, the czar's residence, standing by in case anything unexpected happened to these fragile works of art. He was on call. Tsar Alexander III presented the first of the imperial eggs as a gift to his wife in 1885. Here it is. The first egg, called the hen egg, because the surprise inside, obviously, is a golden hen. And of course, the empress kept it in her home uh, in St. Petersburg. The main characters in our Fabergé story are, of course, 
Nicholas II and his wife, Tsarina Alexandra Fedorovna. He was born in 1868. The imperial couple were the most important of Fabergé's patrons. Here we see them before their marriage. In, 19, sorry, in November of 1894, the young Princess Alex von Hessen Darmstadt married the Tsarevich Nicholas. Here she is as the young princess. After her marriage, she took the name Alexandra Fredorovna at her Russian Orthodox baptism. This 1894 painting shows the wedding ceremony of Nicholas and Alexandra. I couldn't resist it. It's such a wonderful photograph, and there's something mythic about this couple. If you say, why do people care about Fabergé? It's the romance, the mystery, the tragedy, the gorgeousness of the works of art. It grabs you, and I think it grabbed Lillian Thomas Pratt in the 30s in a very big way, 400 objects later. To celebrate the coronation, Fabergé created the imperial coronation egg, which was presented by the ruler at Easter 1897. The surprise inside is an exact replica of the imperial coronation coach used during the ceremony. Simply breathtaking. The imperial couple highly valued Fabergé's jeweled objects, gold and silver, and other treasures. In fact, the only public exhibition at the time held in St. Petersburg showing some of the works of art made by Fabergé owned by the imperial family was an exhibition in 1902 at the St. Peter's residence of Baron de Vries. And here is this very famous exhibition. And you can see in some of the showcases the royal family's collection. In fact, I think I have a detail. Yes, so we are able to identify what was owned by the family. Tsarina Alexandra especially loved to surround herself with objects by Fabergé, as well as Art Nouveau glass and other works of art. Here's her mauve room at the Alexander Palace. It's on the grounds of the Tsatskyo Cielo, the 18th century palace. Alexandra Fedorovna displayed her Fabergé eggs in her private study at the Winter Palace as well. The family and close relatives regularly presented gifts of Fabergé to various family members internationally. Moreover, the imperial couple also presented diplomatic gifts to distinguished individuals throughout their empire and abroad. Here is the imperial family taken during happier times. As you may know, the Tsar's son was born with hemophilia, a rare blood disease. He was both the great joy and the great sorrow of his mother and father. And of course, the empress was under the influence of Rasputin, who did help her son, uh, but it all led crashing down to the revolution. Besides the young Tsarevich Alexei, the four beautiful daughters of the Tsar and Anastasia. Everyone is aware of the sad ending of the Tsar. They were brutally murdered in 1918 in Ectenburg. Here is the children of the Tsar in their final uh, prison before they were killed. Really rather a sad story. Um, American collectors such as Lillian Thomas Pratt and Marjorie Merriweather Post bought the mystique and the allure of the imperial family and their ultimate and tragic lives made Fabergé objects so much more appealing and romantic. And it also was true for you know, Marie Antoinette or Catherine the Great, but this story and this couple uh, and Fabergé is uh, synonymous, I think, of that period. Let us now turn to the important collection formed by Lillian Thomas Pratt at the Virginia Museum of Art. Between 1933 and 1946, Mrs. Pratt assembled a collection of 400 Russian decorative arts 
of which approximately 170 are genuine examples by Fabergé. She was born in Philadelphia in, 1890, in 1876 and married General Motors executive John Lee Pratt in 1917, the year the Russian Romanov dynasty fell. In 1933, Mrs. Pratt purchased her first Fabergé object at the Lord and Taylor department store in New York, where Arm and Hammer was selling objects by Fabergé and others. Many of these great collections in America were formed because the collectors would go to these important department stores. After retirement in 1937, the Pratts lived in historic Chatham Manor uh, from Fredericksburg, Virginia. Here is their farm. Mrs. Pratt bequeathed the collection to the museum in 1947 at her death. So that's a little of the background. Now we're going to talk about specific objects. I apologize for running through that, but it's sort of a long history. It's very complicated. And sadly, Fabergé is forged today, and one must be very careful because the price is, I think, a recent Imperial Egg sold for $20 million, but a small uh, hard stone could go for $2 million, uh, a cigarette case or four or $500,000, very costly, so buyer beware. <laughs> it's very hard to pick a few objects to talk about. Perhaps they're my personal favorites, as well as tell a story about Fabergé. I'll be more informal in this instant because I hope you'll buy the a brilliant catalog by Geza von Habsburg, which is in, uh, for sale. And Geza, of course, is the world authority on the subject, so we're pleased he participated in our catalog and exhibition. Here's one of the five eggs. I'm going to run through it, but hopefully you'll be inspired to go upstairs. The Imperial Pelican Easter Egg, 1897. Gold, diamonds, emeralds, pearls, ivory, watercolor, and glass. And you'll see because of the paintings inside. Stamped Fabergé, Perkin, the assay mark of St. Petersburg, and the silver content and the signature, excuse me, of the uh, painter. You see the um, personal symbol of the Dowager Empress, which is the pelican at the top, feeding her young the symbol of maternal care that recalls the sacrifice of Christ, the pelican tears her flesh so that her children may feed and live from her blood. So this represents that, and the Tsar gave it to his mother, the Empress, in 1898. Of course, it commemorates the 100th anniversary of the founding of the charities of Maria de Fredorovna. Very neoclassical, European-inspired, French style. So obviously St. Petersburg, we'd expect to see the more neo-Russian, old Russian uh, pieces made in Moscow. This is the open view, which I think is fascinating. It shows the uh, orphanages and institutions supported by the Empress. Very accurate, you can identify them. And that, of course, the provisional government took in 1917, and it was sold to Arm & Hammer. Perfect quality. I mean, perfect. One of my personal favorites, which is not on view because it's extremely fragile, glass uh, crystal, is this rock crystal Easter egg with revolving miniatures. Gold, emeralds, sapphires, diamonds, and at the very top, 27 carat Siberian emerald, made by Perkin. And what it shows is 12 of the very important palaces or residences of the uh, imperial family. Uh, wonderful thing, I think I've got a close up. And you can see the initials of the Tsarina at the bottom and the, in the middle before, while she was Princess of Hesse, and then later when she took the name, Alexandra Fedorovna. Here is the Alexander Palace where they lived, uh, closest to me, and the Anichikov Palace, the residence of Nicholas II's mother. Uh, 
an exquisite egg, really. Uh, and we have to remember, these are among the most important eggs in the world. As I said, there are 43 extant, and it's a, a, an attitude to, about Mrs. Pratt that she was able to find and purchase these incredible pieces in the 30s. Um, there were few people buying, certainly at the scale she did. This is the Imperial Tsarevich Easter Egg, 1912. Obviously, it's lapis lazuli and gold and diamonds. We'll see the surprise in a moment. The egg was presented by Tsar Nicholas to his wife. It's based on a 17th century engraved designs from Jean Barin in Paris. The Tsarina kept it in her mauve room at the Alexander Palace. I think I have some details. And it opens up, and these obviously were really created as special momentums for the imperial family. This is her son, Alexei, with the Russian symbols at the top in diamonds. And I think that actually is an ivory painted on uh, ivory. But breathtaking quality, and you know this is a spring, so it's spring loaded, it comes up like that, works beautifully. A smaller egg, but still important, the Red Cross egg of 1915. Uh, silver, gold, enamel, mother of pearl, watercolor. We'll see that in the inside. It's by Wigstrom, St. Petersburg, obviously. The central band in Slavinic says, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It opens up, and you have this exquisite mother of pearl folding screens with the Sisters of Mercy. There they are. Grand Duchess Olga, the Tsar's sister. Grand Duchess Olga, the oldest daughter of the Tsar. Tsarina Alexandra in the center. Grand Duchess Tatiana, his daughter. And Grand Duchess Maria Pavlovna, the Tsar's first cousin. And this is just a photograph showing uh, the sisters. One of my favorite pieces is this Imperial Peter the Great Easter egg, 1903. For color gold, it's important to remember the gold content allows different shades. It's called varicolored gold. Exquisite, because you can really see the different parts. The egg was inspired by a Parisian 18th century necessaire in the Hermitage collection. I think it's the next one. But here, of course, is Nicholas II and the symbol representing him, the Winter Palace. And I think the date at the top, middle, it's 1903. The other side, we'll see in a minute. That's the 18th century necessaire at the Hermitage that Fabergé would have seen. And you see how he looks to the past, replicates it. This is beautiful as well. And that's the other side with Peter the Great, 1703 in the date, and on the right, the first log cabin in uh, St. Petersburg. Obviously, it's the 200th anniversary of the founding of St. Petersburg by Peter the Great. The surprise is a replica of the Peter the Great Monument in St. Petersburg, 1782. There it is on the left, and the surprise. I might add that it took Mrs. Pratt 33 months to pay off this egg. It cost her $16,000. At the time, a car cost $1,100, and the average yearly salary was $2,400. But we have her invoices, and she paid between $150 and $750 regularly for this egg, one of her most prized possessions. This is a great piece. I'm told by the specialists, one of the great pieces of Fabergé silver, one of my favorites, too, a monumental koshk, uh, made in Moscow. Silver, and you can tell obviously it's got an old Moscow, a Muscovite, old Russia subject, so it doesn't look European or 
you know, Parisian style. So you'll see those two things. Usually the old Russian style things are made in Moscow. Uh, these are the legendary heroes of medieval warriors. There's some stones, uh, the great piece of Fabergé silver, amethyst, chrysophase. There are drawings similar, this isn't for it, but related. You can see there were design drawings. Another beautiful piece, again in the old Russian style. This frame, silver, cabochon agates, sapphires, chalcedony. Uh, cipher of Nicholas II, a very important silver piece. Another piece more popular is the rabbit pitcher. These are large, about 15 inches. Made in Moscow, silver and garnet, and the head comes off and it's gilded and it's a, a pitcher. I doubt it was used. And another exquisite silver piece, furniture by Fabergé, is, how do I say it? It's so rare. I think there's six pieces known. So this piece is gorgeous. It's again in the European style, pilsender wood. The top is nephrite like a jade. The designer, Armfelt, probably made the wood frame, or the frame would have been made outside. The silver, of course, would have been made in the Fabergé firm. These furniture pieces are extraordinarily rare, so do take a close look this, uh, in the Parisian style. We introduced the talk with this wonderful piece. It's probably a seven or eight inch imperial column portrait frame. I think there were only five ever made. So it's extraordinarily rare. It's gold, silver, diamonds, and obviously watercolor, made by Wigstrom in St. Petersburg. It was presented by Tsar Nicholas to the Field Marshal Mulatan in 1908. And as I say, they're one of five of these column portraits that were specifically given by the Tsar. So this is one of the 20 best most important pieces in the collection. These Wigstrom design drawings, you have a sense of the inspiration. This charming hard stone figure, very small, six or seven inches, hugely important. As I say, the record price today is about two and a half million dollars for a much larger figure, but these are prized and they're rare. As I say, only 70 around. They all uh, derive from the hardstone figures of Florentine 17th century objects. Here the sailor is adventurine, quartz, onyx, lapis lazuli, gold sapphires. His cap, cap is inscribed Tsarnista, which is the name of a yacht, the son of Tsar Alexander III's yacht, and his mistress purchased it at the London branch and presented it to her husband. That's the original box, too. A very fine Art Nouveau frame. You don't see much Art Nouveau with Fabergé, but you can see it in the curly cues. This rock crystal frame with a photo of Grand Duchess Tatiana. These photos are authentic, but they're added later to help sell the product. They really do. They have photos from newspapers, from whatever, we know the photos that were original to certain pieces. This one was not in this piece, but was added subsequently, probably after it was sold in the 20s. The Art Nouveau piece here, unusual, is this snuff box. Very rare to see Art Nouveau style. Quartz or feldstone, feldspar, diamond, ruby, emerald. And it's a beautiful small piece. It's the hard stones we mentioned earlier that are so prized. This piece, particularly near me, is inspired from the Dresden Kunstkammer that Fabergé would have seen growing up where he lived, the collections of the uh, kings of Saxony, I believe. This piece here, to me, is marked by Perkin, uh, nephrite, silver, very fine, important piece. The piece next to it shows you the neoclassical style more European influence versus Moscow or Russian. It's an imperial presentation box. You can tell by the uh, marks of the czar here. Cyrillic N2, if you will, N11. Uh, very fine, exquisite, 
uh, piece, compare that to the first piece we saw, the blue piece with the Russian coat of arms that sadly is a forgery. The difference between the two is the breathtaking quality and the simplicity, if you will. These are some of the hard stones that are so popular. Here's a dachshund, smoky agate, he's at the top. As you know, the animals were inspired by Chinese carved Netsky, right? And the hard stones themselves would have been bought from Peter Hoffer, E. Kattenberg, and later in 1908, Mr. Fabergé had his own workshop. This is unmarked here. The French bulldog is adventuring court below, and the obsidian owl with the tiger eyes over there. I always think the flowers are breathtaking. The Queen of England today has 20. She originally had, or the family originally had, well, 20, but 80 are known. We had 30, but it was discovered that 24 were what Geza von Habsburg calls Fauberge. <laughs> not a good word. Now, in the sense that faux means forgery. And that's not uncommon. These are the ones that are most commonly uh, forged. The globe flowers, globe flowers are beautiful. Gold, emerald, the imperial warrant mark of Fabergé. It's a product of the Moscow workshops. The crystal vase, obviously, is to show water, if you will. The one closest to me is a dandelion, nephrite, rock crystal, and I'm always so intrigued. The white is asbestos fiber, <laughs> so don't inhale. Uh, but an exquisite piece there, and the far screen is the lily of the valleys, nephrite. These are very fine pieces, in fact, and to have six authentic Fabergé hearthstones is thrilling. I love this piece. It's quirky in the sense that it's Fabergé's enamel looking to 17th century Kremlin workshop pieces. This was inspired by the 17th century Moscow Kremlin. It's marked Fabergé, a separate imperial warrant. Julius Rappaport was the workmaster. It's very rare for this type. This was made in St. Petersburg, actually, but looking to the Moscow or Muscovite style. A very rare, it's a Bertina or a punch bowl. And you can see the different types of enameling, whether it's Bastai or Champlevé, uh, gemstones, I think there's emeralds, sapphires, rubies, garnets, blue topaz, an exquisite, very rare piece. This always is a popular piece because everyone sees the photo of Tsar Alexander II, added later, it was never part of this piece. This is an enamel frame. Mrs. Pratt particularly collected parasol handles, enamel uh, pieces, frames, small items, and fortunately for us, imperial Easter eggs, because we have the collection, which is wonderful. Um, this is Victor Arney's work, silver, silver gilt, and enamel. This is a poignant piece, another enamel, French style. The star frame is directly associated with the imperial family at their murder because it was on the possessions of the family, this piece, and we know because the archival documents of the possessions of the family were documented at the time. And it certainly has an original photograph of the Grand Duchess Tatiana and we know it was acquired jointly by Nicholas and his wife in 1896. And we know that because it has a scratch inventory number, 55135. You can check the archives in Russia, and they're really the sales registers. So we know the price, the date, who bought it. So when we say something is bought by or documented, it's certainly not taken lightly. And it does add important historical and monetary value. This always intrigues people, this box with an Arabic inscription at the top. Uh, Perkin, he's one of the top workmen at the time, workmaster. It's a box set with a carnelian inscribed with an Arabic script. And the enameling is important. I would pay attention to that, too, because he's 
Fabergé's masters are extraordinary uh, workers of what might be over 145 hues of different color enamel. Also, look closely because the enamel, of course, is sort of like liquid glass that hardens. Under it is the gold, oops, the gold, and there are artists who use a guilloche to engine turn or inscribe the surface of the gold. So you'll see, maybe you can see it here, yes, zigzag lines. That's the guilloche or the engine turning of the gold to create these infinite patterns of uh, added decoration. Very briefly, I want to mention Faubergé. Um, every collection probably has them, and it's not just in Fabergé. Here's one of the clear Faubergé or forgeries, this box, gold, enamel, silver, diamonds, rubies. Forged marks of Fabergé, the Cyrillic MP, probably the fake mark for Michael Perkin, and marks for St. Petersburg 4, 1898, forged. And the 72, which of course is the gold content. Um, on the surface, you can see underneath the blue is this engine turning, is the Fabergé Moscow Imperial Warrant combined with Perkin, but on the top is the, the double-headed eagle. That symbol was very rarely used because it was used by the royal family, and it was when you gave a gift, it was there. But an unsuspecting person would say, oh, clearly this is made for the czar. And many of the inventory and invoices we have of Mrs. Pratt's purchases, it said, bought from the mauve room of the Imperial Palace, anyone buying Fabergé wanted it to be owned by the Imperial family. Not true, sometimes certainly, but was the key selling point. Uh, two of the 26 Faubergé flowers. Here is the primrose, carnelian, furthest from me, nephrite, rock crystal, gold, and diamonds. Forged mark of Fabergé, HW in Cyrillic for Henrik Wigstrom. And the aster closest to me, chalcedony, nephrite, jasper. When you take these Faubergé pieces and put them next to authentic ones, I'm always struck, and again, it's that feeling you get after looking at hundreds of them or seeing other works authentic. I'm always struck by the, what is the word I want to use called? Awkward, bulky, cumbersome, unrefined. They don't have the exquisite quality when you look at a gorgeous piece of Fabergé, your breath is taken away. These just have a clunkiness, uh, whatever. And in fact, I wanted to read something that I read just recently. Um, I think that's probably the end of the slides. Let's see. Yes. I um, wanted to read one thing that was so important. I saw it last week from Geza von Habsburg Publications. We heard about it, and Arm and Hammer the owner of Petroleum Oil in Los Angeles, uh, was a dealer, really, years ago. But I want to read this, which comes from Geza von Habsburg. The Pratt Collection provides what appears to be clear evidence of the truth of Victor Hammer's claim in 1992 that his brother, Armand, had an understanding with Mr. Mikion, head of the Commissar for Foreign Trade, Mickeyson is said to have supplied Arm & Hammer with a set of hallmarking tools acquired from Fabergé's workshop with which Armin was to mark unsigned objects, including fraudulent pieces, and then send them back to Russia a percentage of the sale proceeds. Such hallmarking tools were repeatedly used by Hammer to authenticate a series of 20 newly made flowers, as well as some hard stones and objects bought by Mrs. Pratt. And I ended on that not to 
put fear in you, but to say that the field of Fabergé is very complicated. It's a very rewarding subject. I hope you enjoy the collection here. We're so grateful to Mrs. Pratt who bought these in the 30s, and we're so grateful to the many scholars over the world who have documented this extraordinary jeweler and silversmith who had a firm of over 500 people. Um, and it's so wonderful to see it here in Montreal so all of you can enjoy it. Thank you very much indeed for your attention.